fun. The hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant. And Dan Novak. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, World Health Organization Africa Director Machidiso Moeti says that Africa will get 25 percent fewer COVID-19 vaccine doses than expected by the end of 2021. Her comments to reporters last week came as the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said just over three percent of people in Africa have been fully vaccinated. African health officials were surprised by the announcement that the COVAX effort to give vaccines to low and middle income countries. Is again lowering its delivery expectations. The United Nations runs the COVAX plan, which was organized to make certain poor countries get the vaccine. Moeti told reporters that the announcement was in part because of the prioritization of bilateral deals over international solidarity. Moeti noted that certain COVAX difficulties, such as export controls on vaccine doses and the introduction of booster shots by some countries, are the reasons for the 25 percent reduction. A booster shot is an extra amount of a vaccine given to provide added protection against a disease. Moeti noted. That Covax has delivered over five million vaccine doses to African countries in September, but she added, three times as many doses have been thrown away in the United States alone since March. Every dose is precious, Moeti said. She said that wealthy countries have promised to share one billion doses worldwide. But so far, only 120 million have been released. If companies and countries prioritize vaccine equity, this pandemic would be over quickly, Moeti added. The WHO says the goal of vaccinating 10 percent of people in Africa by the end of September will not be met. The aim now is to vaccinate 40 percent by the end of the year. The Africa CDC says 145 million vaccine doses have been secured across the continent. About 111 million doses, or 77 percent, have been given out. Some richer countries, including the United States, are beginning to give out booster shots. Using up more vaccine, the WHO director general called for a delay in giving out booster shots until the end of the year to deal with the severe vaccine inequality. John in Kingasong is the Africa CDC director. He told reporters last week that the problem we have with the third booster doses. As we have not seen enough science to be certain it is necessary, and King Asong said he fully understands that people with weak natural body defense systems against disease need to increase their protection. But for otherwise healthy individuals, I just haven't seen enough science. He added. African countries have recently seen a strong increase in COVID cases, driven mostly by the Delta variant. 
but the WHO Africa director reported a decrease of nearly 25% in new cases at the beginning of the month. She said that is the steepest drop in eight weeks since the peak in July. South Korean researchers say they have developed a skin-like material that behaves like the skin of a chameleon. It can change colors to look like its surroundings. The team was led by Ko Sung Hwan, a mechanical engineering professor at Seoul National University. The team created the skin with a special liquid that turns colors in different temperatures. These changes are controlled by flexible heaters made of very small wires. If you are in a desert and you wear forest-colored clothing, you can easily be seen, Ko told Reuters news agency. Changing colors and forms actively with your surroundings is central to the technology, Ko said. The technology uses something called thermochromic liquid crystal and silver nanowire heaters. Thermochromic means heat causes the colors to change. Nanowires are just like normal electrical wires, but they are extremely small. Ko and the team demonstrated this technology using a chameleon-shaped robot with color-seeking sensors. The skin tried to copy whatever colors the sensors saw around it. In a video, the robot walked on red, blue, and green floors. It immediately changed color to look like its surroundings. Ko explained to Reuters how the material works. He said when the sensors find color information, they move that information to a very small processor. Then the information goes to silver nanowire heaters. When the heaters reach a specified temperature, the thermochromic liquid crystal changes its color, Co said. Though the skin is made of many layers, it is thinner than a human hair. By adding more silver nanowire layers in simple shapes like lines or squares, the skin can create complex designs. I'm Alice Bryant. Andrew wanted to get a COVID-19 vaccine, but was afraid his parents would not approve. He signed up for a vaccine in secret. Then he told his parents just before he was to receive the vaccine. But his father told him no. He said, you are not getting this vaccine. Andrew said it was the first time his father had ever done something like that. He grabbed my shirt and yelled in my face, said Andrew, a 17-year-old student in Hoover, Alabama. Children under 18 need their parents' permission to get medical treatment, such as the vaccine against COVID-19. Students and organizers of campaigns that directly target young people for vaccination efforts are facing reactions from families. Millions of American students have returned to school in recent weeks. 
At the same time, the coronavirus continues to spread at high rates in some places. U.S. President Joe Biden has pushed school districts to persuade students to get vaccinated. Biden's administration has also pushed for clinics in schools that provide vaccines. But distrust of the vaccine and other concerns remain in communities in many parts of the country. And many state governments and school districts are not pushing the vaccine in some areas for several reasons. In Tennessee, the health department ended vaccination events and outreach aimed at children. Republican lawmakers criticized advertisements aimed at children that included words like "Give COVID-19 vaccines a shot." Republican lawmakers accused the health department of peer pressuring children to get the vaccine. It is estimated that half of people ages 12 to 17 have been vaccinated across the country. That age group has been able to get the Pfizer vaccine since May. Pfizer is currently testing a vaccine for younger children. Last week, the Los Angeles Unified School District School Board voted to require vaccines for students 12 and older. Conflicting information surrounding vaccination efforts at schools. Is damaging trust between parents and school officials. School officials in Kettering, Ohio, said they received death threats in August. They came after social media videos on TikTok falsely claimed the district was vaccinating children without parental permission. There was no truth to the claims, but they caused huge hysteria in the community. Said Scott Inskeep, the head of Kettering City Schools, "Our families really are struggling with both information and disinformation." Inskeep said, "It's like a match being put to a gasoline fire. When it starts, it's hard to put out." Research by the Kaiser Family Foundation said that eight states permit children to get vaccines without parental permission. The states are Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Alabama. In some areas, there have been efforts to make it easier for children to get vaccinated. State lawmakers in New York and New Jersey introduced laws that would permit teens to agree to vaccines without their parents' permission. But they were not approved. The Washington D.C. City Council passed a law giving young children the ability to make medical decisions, but a group is disputing the law in court. In May, officials in two Oregon counties banned health officials from giving vaccines to underage children without parental permission. Yamhill County Commissioner Lindsay Bershauer, who is also the mother of three teenagers, said, "Our children are not the property of the state of Oregon." But the counties removed the ban after state health officials released an opinion saying children 15 and older have the right to make their own health decisions. Alabama's law permits children like Andrew. Who disagreed with his father to get the vaccine on their own, but in reality, that is almost impossible. The Alabama Department of Public Health requires parental permission. So do large pharmacies. Andrews Hoover High School does not push for COVID nineteen vaccinations on its website or social media sites. There has been no sign the school will hold a vaccine clinic. 
The day after their argument, Andrew's father took him to the pharmacy and signed his permission form without saying a word. I'm Dan Novak. From VOA Learning English, welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. On March 4th, 1829, Andrew Jackson was sworn in as president. The sky over Washington was cloudy that day, but the clouds parted and the sun shone through as Jackson began the ride to the Capitol building. Thousands of cheering supporters saw this change in weather as a good sign. So many people crowded around the Capitol that Jackson had to climb a wall and enter from the back. He walked through the building and onto the open area at the front where the ceremony would be held. The ceremony itself was simple. Jackson made a speech that few in the crowd were able to hear. Then Chief Justice John Marshall swore in the new president. In the crowd was a newspaper man from Kentucky, Amos Kendall. It is a proud day for the people, Kendall wrote. General Jackson is their own president. From the Capitol, Jackson rode down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. Behind him followed all those who had watched him become the nation's seventh president. The crowds followed him all the way into the White House, where food and drink had been put out for a party. Everyone tried to get in at once. Clothing was torn. Glasses and dishes were broken. Chairs and tables were damaged. Never had there been a party like this at the president's mansion. Jackson stayed for a while, but the crush of people tired him, and he was able to leave. He spent the rest of the day at his hotel room in Virginia. The guests at the White House finally left after drinks were put on the table outside the building. Many of the people left through windows because the doorways were so crowded. Jackson was popular with many voters who saw him as representing the common man. But Jackson's first term seemed to be mostly a political battle with his own vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Calhoun wanted to become the next president, but Jackson preferred his Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren. The split between Jackson and Calhoun deepened over another issue. Jackson learned that Calhoun had once called for Jackson's arrest. Calhoun wanted to punish Jackson for his unauthorized military campaign into Spanish Florida in 1818. The most important division between the two men was Calhoun's belief about who had more power, the states or the federal government. Calhoun came to believe the rights of the states were stronger than the rights of the federal government. His feelings became well known during a debate on a congressional bill. The year before Jackson took office, Congress passed a bill to require taxes on imports. The purpose of the taxes was to protect American industries. The state of South Carolina, Calhoun's state, opposed the measure. South Carolina, like other southern states, had almost no industry. It was an agricultural area. Import taxes would only raise the price of products the South imported. 
South Carolina refused to pay the tax. Calhoun wrote a long statement defending South Carolina's action. In the statement, he developed what was called the Doctrine of Nullification. The doctrine declared that the power of the federal government was not supreme. Calhoun argued that, instead, supreme power belonged to the states. He said states did not surrender this power when they approved the Constitution. In any dispute between the states and the federal government, he said, the states should decide what is right. Calhoun argued that if the federal government passed a law that any state thought was not constitutional or against its interests, that state could temporarily suspend the law. The other states of the Union, Calhoun said, would then be asked to decide the question of the law's constitutionality. If two-thirds of the states approved the law, the complaining state would have to accept it or leave the Union. If less than two-thirds of the states approved it, then the law would be rejected. None of the states would have to obey it. It would be nullified, canceled. Senators Robert Hayne of South Carolina and Daniel Webster of Massachusetts debated the question of nullification in Congress. Senator Hayne spoke first. He said that there was no greater evil than giving more power to the federal government. The major point of his speech could be put into a few words. Liberty first, union afterwards. Senator Webster said Hain had spoken foolishly. Liberty and union could not be separated, Webster said. It was liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. No one really knew how President Andrew Jackson felt about nullification. He made no public statement during the debate. Leaders in South Carolina developed a plan to get the president's support. They decided to hold a big dinner honoring the memory of Thomas Jefferson. Jackson agreed to attend the dinner. The speeches were carefully planned. They began by praising the democratic ideas of Jefferson. Next, they discussed South Carolina's opposition to the import tax. Finally, the speeches were finished. It was time for toasts. President Jackson made the first one. He stood up, raised his glass, and looked straight at Vice President John C. Calhoun. He waited for the cheering to stop. Our union, he said, it must be preserved. Calhoun rose with the others to drink the toast. He had not expected Jackson's opposition to nullification. His hand shook, and he spilled some of the wine from his glass. Calhoun was called on to make the next toast. The Union, he said, next to our liberty, most dear. He waited a moment, then continued. May we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states and by giving equally the benefits and burdens of the Union. President Jackson left a few minutes later. Most of those at the dinner left with him. The nation now knew how the president felt, and the people were with him, opposed to nullification. But the idea was not dead among some people in South Carolina, the nullifiers held a majority of seats in the state's legislature at that time. They called a special convention. 
Within five days, convention delegates approved a declaration of nullification. They said citizens of South Carolina need not pay the federal import taxes. The nullifiers also declared that if the federal government tried to use force against South Carolina, then the state would withdraw from the union and form its own independent government. This cut very deeply with Jackson. Jackson was a nationalist. He was a great believer in the federal union. He was a flag-waving patriot. Uh, And as Jackson saw it, nullification was the beginning of the end of the United States as a nation. That was historian Daniel Feller. He says Jackson believed in a limited federal government. But that did not mean the people of every state should decide what the Constitution means. That way lies chaos, <laughs> as, as Jackson said. Either we have a national government or we don't. And if Congress does pass laws which might prove to be unconstitutional, we have a procedure for dealing with that. We have the Supreme Court. We have the ability of the people and their elected representatives to appeal to Congress to repeal those laws to take them back. But you can't have every state going off on its own and deciding what the Constitution says. Jackson wrote a proclamation answering the nullifiers. In it, he said, America's Constitution formed a government, not just an association or group of sovereign states. South Carolina had no right to cancel a federal law or to withdraw from the Union. Jackson explained that it was his duty as president to enforce the laws of the land, even, as Daniel Feller says, if he had to use force. It's going to come to a test of of arms, and then, and this I can quote, and it was in italics, underlined, emphasized in, in the printed version of the proclamation. Disunion by armed force is treason. Are you really ready to incur its guilt? Jackson sent eight warships to the port of Charleston, South Carolina, and soldiers to federal military bases in the state. While preparing to use force, Jackson offered hope for a peaceful settlement. In a message to Congress, he spoke of reducing the federal import tax that hurt the sale of southern cotton overseas. He said the tax could be reduced because the national debt would soon be paid. Congress passed a compromise bill to end the import tax by 1842. South Carolina's congressman accepted the compromise and the state's legislature called another convention. This time, the delegates voted to end the Nullification Act they had approved earlier. They did not, however, give up their belief in the idea of nullification. Daniel Feller says one reason is because Southern politicians thought they might need to use nullification later. An anti-slavery movement was beginning to grow in the country. Some Southerners worried that Congress would one day make laws they did not like against slavery. The issues of slavery and states' rights would continue to be areas of conflict. Eventually, they would help start the Civil War in 1861. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 